here is, is a, a picture of the domain structure of tau, and the, the thing that I want to point out is this box here is the so-called repeat domain, three or four repeats. There's, the repeat domain is the one that interacts with the microtubules in a physiological sense, but it is also responsible for the formation of the paratelic filaments, and therefore the physiological function and the pathological function are encoded into the same part of the molecule. So it's like a switch, either pathological or physiological switch. A fantasy model of tau um, uh, sitting in an unfolded way on, the to on top of the microtubule. This uh, highly um, soluble, uh, open, hydrophilic nature of tau, it does not aggregate. And one of the points that I'd like to make uh, in, is, is that tau by itself, and I'll show you some evidence in a minute, tau by itself does not aggregate. In spite of the fact that we see uh, aggregations, uh, aggregates of tau in, in various brain diseases uh, in a very stereotypical fashion, tau is so highly soluble, it has no reason to aggregate unless we assume that there is some other factor that helps the aggregation, and macromolecules may play an important event in, uh, in helping tau to get on its way to aggregation. So tau by itself does not do any harm as far as aggregation is concerned, but in, co in the contact with other macromolecules, it may do so. If you want to interfere with this toxic uh, pathway of aggregation, then there, you can do two things. You can uh, either uh, knowing what the elements are that cause the aggregation, namely these hexapeptide motifs, uh, you can either change those hexapeptide motifs so that they cannot aggregate, and one way of doing this, this at least in vitro or in animal models, is to put in proline mutations because the residue proline is not compatible with the beta structure. Now let me talk about the regular uh, motives for controlling aggregation. I mentioned before the uh, elements, the hexapeptide motives that are responsible for, for the uh, uh, aggregation. The, these are uh, elements at the beginning of repeat R2 and uh, re uh, repeat R3. At the beginning of repeat 2 and uh, uh, beginning, uh, beginning of uh, repeat 3, you have these hexapeptide motives. Uh, VQIINK or VQIVYK, and uh, and um, if you mess around, they have an enhanced potential for beta structure. And uh, and if you change these peptides, then of course you affect. Uh, aggregation and uh, Martin von Bergen, who, who discovered this in the lab, he he uh, coined the term pro-aggregant uh, mutations and anti-aggregant mutation. The pro-aggregant corresponds to the mutation delta K280, which is observed in in, in tauopathies, uh, which enhances the beta propensity of this element. And the anti-aggregant simply you you stick a proline in here, you stick a proline in there, and you get no more uh, no more aggregation. And the the reason why this, is, uh, this turned out to be important uh, in our uh, um, experience is that transgenic mice or transgenic worms or transgenic anything, if they have pro-aggregant mutations, they get sick. And if you just do the anti-aggregant, they stay healthy. So that is a very simple way of manipulating the state of disease. If, you, if tau cannot aggregate, and in fact this protein does not aggregate in, in these different uh, animal models, then you have no effect of tau. You can overexpress it. There may be slight effects of overexpression, but they, the, uh, the animals don't get sick. A few words about transgenic animals. Here is, again, the tau structure with the hexapeptide motifs. This is where the delta K280 mutation is, and most of the models we made uh, consist of uh, placing pro-aggregant tau into a mouse or, uh, uh, or, or an anti-aggregant tau and then comparing the two. And, um, and this is done in a uh, inducible way, uh, controlled by uh, doxycycline basically, so we can switch the, the expression of tau on and then we can observe the aggregation of tau and the development of pathology, and we can also switch it off, which is a nice part of this application. So you switch the tau off, the tau disappears, and you can ask the question, does the disease go away? It does, actually. So now, first of all, showing you a pro-aggregant mouse, three months old, has a lot of 
tau deposits in the brain. An anti-aggregant mouse, even though it's 22 months old and very aged, shows absolutely no aggregation, which shows you the power of replacing a single proline in an aggregation-prone filament. You get rid of aggregations. It's perfect cure on the basic of, on, on the level of molecular biology, at least. We have the same thing on the level of C. elegans. C. elegans uh, moves nicely uh, around, but when it expresses a tau in the neurons, and uh, which gets aggregated, then it gets paralyzed. And uh, we use the C. elegans uh, uh, as a cheap way of monitoring drugs, drug effects. I can't go on here. Uh, so I won't go into this, but just show you when, we, when they are paralyzed, this is where the, the, the mice have, uh, the, the C. elegans, the worms have uh, aggregated tau in their neurons, but when you treat them with aggregation inhibitors, then they move quite nicely around. So this is, uh, this is, not, this is an easy experiment to do because the, uh, the, the worms take up the drugs much, much better than, of course, uh, the mice because there is no blood brain, bar brain barrier. So you can check whether, uh, whether an aggregation inhibitor actually works. You can check this relatively quickly. And